Uh, did I turn this on? Yeah, I did. Um, hi, so as he said, I'm Monica. I'm not Waldorf on Twitter and GitHub and internet places. That was my whole intro slide. So um, I don't work on Polymer anymore, but if you have questions about Polymer, I'll still answer them. Um, I work on Magenta now, which is a, basically a team of researchers in Google Brain. We're trying to use machine learning for music and art and for creativity uh, to work with musicians and artists. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Um, the reason why I started working on Magenta is because I realized that a lot of the things that I'm really passionate about are building really silly things. Um, and here, silly is like a hard word because how I use the word silly is not how like most of you use the word silly. Uh, if I say a thing is silly, it doesn't mean it's not serious or not important or I don't care about it. I care about all of the things that I make and sometimes they take me like six months so they're not really silly. Um, sometimes you can call them art. I wouldn't call them art because that's really pretentious and uh, it's really intimidating. That means like Monet and I are in the same neighborhood of occupations and that's absurd. Um, and also the problem with calling things art is that people get really serious. When we refer to something as art, society has trained us that we have to judge it and be like, oh, well, is it going to be a museum? This is kind of modern. I don't really like this kind of art. So I don't call them art. I call them silly things. And then people sort of relax and enjoy them and play with them and have fun, which is really what I want people to do. This is one of the things that I've built recently. Um, it's called Midi City 2000, and it builds cities out of rock and roll. Um, a lot of the things that I work with nowadays are MIDI files, and I try to like use MIDI files in creative ways. Um, and in this one, I build cities out of these MIDI files. A MIDI file is like a music representation of a song. And if you think about songs, they have different instruments, which are the different rows of buildings. Um, and they have like random notes and pitches that appear at a point in time, and those are the buildings, because pitches are like the height. Um, and when you, uh, you can load a MIDI, and maybe you'll recognize this song. Oh no, the audio just died, it was working so well. Hold on, let's try it again. Guys, if the audio doesn't work, the whole talk is ruined. No, okay, we're gonna do the dance again. Or unplug this, plug this back in. Do it. Okay. Does anybody know what this is? It's Aladdin. But the thing about music is that once I load it, I can start playing with it. I can reduce some of the instruments. I can reduce how many notes I'm playing. And this builds a whole new city. But it doesn't just build a new city, because it changed that melody. So now you have a whole new song, too. This is like a weird remix of Aladdin. great, but it's still like a remix. Like I wasn't a musician and I used this weird tool that made like a really beautiful drawing and then like a new melody. So it's kind of like a strange new instrument. So that's kind of fun. These are the things that I built. The thing about building is that making things is objectively good. Like it is good for me. This is how I learn. I didn't know how to like play with MIDI before I built a lot of these things and now I do. But making things is actually good. There's this like business insider article called why you should make art even if you're bad. Um, and I try to make a joke about there being art on Business Insider and I failed, so that m must mean it's like a serious article. But it's like this like 10 scientific like, uh, experiments that they've done and they figured out that like if you do 30 minutes of free art, like just like doodling and stuff like that, it like reduces your cortisol level. You're actually less stressed out and like it reduces your anxiety. Uh, and you don't have to be good at it, you just have to do it. If you do things like doodling while you're learning new things, you like form different uh, mappings in your brain so you remember things better. Making things is good. It makes you feel good. So I make these things. I feel good. But in particular, I make these things so that you can make things. Because you might not be a good musician, or you might not be a good artist. But if I build something where you can like, play with it and make something out of it, then you know, you're spending those 30 minutes doing something, and then you end up feeling better. Um, and the, like, the, the, the kind of things that I build are usually like, interactive. I don't build static things that you just look at. Um, I don't find that very fun. And I used, I used to call that generative art. Generative art is a word that basically means that something generates a whole bunch of things. Uh, and it's not usually interactive. So somebody like renamed this for me when they wrote like a summary of my talk to generative delight. And I think that's a really good name. Um, and to me, it's basically this idea of like a little bit of view and a little bit of code and a little bit of randomness. 
Um, and all of these things are needed for something to be really successful for me. Because if like a little bit of view isn't in there, then it's just like this basic and boring generative art project, and I don't really love it. If my code isn't there, then you have to do all of the work to like make that music happen, and that's not really fun for you. And if there's no random delight, you're not gonna use it a second time. Like you're gonna know exactly what it, what it does the first time, and you're gonna be like, eh, I don't really want it. So these things are the, the kind of things that I look forward to. I started doing this with a project called Emojulate. And um, Emojulate is really straightforward. You upload an image and it pixelates it and it replaces all the pixels with an emoji of that color. And this was kind of a failed generative delight project for me because sure, it's got some like randomness in it, but like your creative vision isn't in there. If you are having like a bad day and you're like, I just want you know, sad emoji in it, Emojulate doesn't do that. It like just picks a color that matches it. And the other sad thing about Emojulate is that once I've shown you this, if you have like an image of a cat, you kind of know what it's gonna look like. So you're probably not gonna go over and over again to like play with this. Uh, this is different from Midi City where like I showed you what Aladdin looks like and maybe you know what like Bohemian Rhapsody sounds like, but you have no idea what it's gonna look like a, like a city. That's still an interesting and curious thing to do. So the way I fixed it is by introducing rules. I'm actually a huge fan of rules when it comes to anything. Uh, the rules that I made for Emojulate, and like for like three years I only built things, it was with emoji. So everything that I built had to use emoji as like the output. So I built all of these things that were like doing things with emoji. And once I fixed that, the output of my projects, then what I had to focus on was sort of like how you would interact with them. How, like what, the, what is the creative way that you're interacting with the emoji? Now, most of the things that I work are with music, so the question is, well, great, we all have MIDI files, how do we interact with this MIDI file? And this isn't true just in art, this is true in like all programming. Once you like set some things, some, some rules in, then you can like explore different areas. If um, you're trying to build like a Twitter, Twitter clone, let's say, and you don't have any rules, you're gonna be like, well, I can use any framework, I can use any backend, the world's my oyster, and then there's like this panic about what are you gonna do. But if I tell you that, uh, you have to use like web components and you have to use like IndexedDB for your database and it has to like be a PWA, then the things that you're gonna focus on are, well, what is it gonna look like and uh, how do people actually use it rather than like the technology behind it. So rules are really important so that we can make things better. So after I built Emojulate, I built this thing called Emoji Garden. And Emoji Garden ended up being like hugely successful, um, but again, I thought it was a failed project for me because much like Emojilate, so Emoji Garden is basically this like grid of uh, emoji, and every time you like press refresh, you can like change the grid, and you get like a random delightful garden. You can look at it; it's very peaceful. But again, your creative vision in there isn't in there. Maybe carrots murdered your family. You're still gonna get carrots every once in a while. Emoji Garden doesn't care. And again, it's not super, super randomly delightful. Like, you're always kind of going to get the same emoji. It's gonna look cute, and you might like use it as like a home page, but again, it's not a super good generative delight project. But it ended up being hugely successful because of the platform that I built in it. So in and of itself, Emoji Garden isn't the generative art project that I wanted, but I built it on a, pro on a platform called Glitch. And if you haven't heard of Glitch, it looks like this. It's kind of like a new code pen or JS pen or whatever. It's like an online code editor where you can like see your preview, add files. It's like a little like coding environment on the web. But the thing about Glitch is that it encourages remixes. So for every project that you see, people tend to like document it really well. You can ask people questions about particular lines of code. And in particular, you can take that project and clone it and like make it your own. So I built mo most of my projects on Glitch because I don't want to host my code ever again. Um, but because I built it in here, what people ended up doing is taking my emoji garden, which was like an average project, and making their own gardens. And that's kind of how the generative art project began. Their gardens were like the generative art that I wanted. People made hedgehog gardens where you only got hedgehogs and other animals and other plants. They made emoji deserts, which had fires and scorpions and they're terrifying. Uh, they made skies, so they could like, just like look up, and it's like clouds and owls and night sometimes. Uh, my friend Jane built this, and she's not a programmer. She's a lexicographer at dictionary.com, and she was like, I want to build a sky, and she just did, and she didn't really need to know how to program. Uh, this was my favorite. It's emoji voidscapes. It shows you voids. Uh, it's really ominous. Sometimes it shows you like eyeballs and things that say that the end is soon, uh, and syringes, and I love it. I don't know what it means. 
It's great. So the reason why this became a successful project for me is because of the platform that I built it on. Um, because the thing about art and about all the code that we write is that we don't make it in a void. The kind of tools that we use end up sort of shaping what the art we make is. Um, if you think about like an oil painter who's super talented with oil paints, if you take their oil paints away and give them like socks or safety pins or something, they're still going to make art. It's just going to be very different looking from the art that they no normally produce. So the medium in which we deliver this uh, really makes a difference. Because in this sort of weird online world that we live in, the devices that we use, the code that we use, everything that we do with technology it ends up influencing the end result of a thing. And this is absolutely true of the code that we use as well. Uh, one of the reasons why Emoji Garden was really easy to use, and I'll show you this in the next slide, is that it used libraries that are made for creative coding. I didn't like build it from scratch in JavaScript. I used a library that like its own entire goal is procedural art. Um, and this usually happens. If you use a library that's made for the thing that you wanted to do, it's going to be much easier for you to write that code. Uh, if you think about like just visual art, a language like processing is really straightforward and it wants you to like paint things on a canvas. So it's going to be much easier to build visual things with processing than say something like C++. That's not to say that you can't build art in C++. It's just you're going to like spend most of your time wrangling pointers, figuring out maybe OpenGL, being really sad when nothing works, build a ray tracer. Um, and the more time you have to spend you know, wrangling really basic code so that you can like, draw a square on the screen, then the less time you have to you know, build the thing you actually want to build. Unless what you want to do is like, build a square with C++, in which case, that's great, do that. But most of the artists that I meet don't really want to do that. So Emoji Garden is built with a thing called Tracery.js. And Tracery.js is a library built by Kate Compton. She's at Galaxy Kate on Twitter. And it's built for procedural art. It, its goal is to like, very easily generate things according to rules. Um, and Emoji Garden was really easy to remix because of this library decision. So the way tra Tracery.js works um, is that you basically define what your world is as a set of tokens. In my case, it's a grid of M. I think I use that for model. I honestly don't know. Let's say M for Monica's, um, V for visitors, and S for snacks. And then um, you define what those tokens are. So the model is like cactuses and empty spaces. The visitors are a mouse and a hedgehog or whatever. And then what Tracery does is it looks in this grid, and for every single token, it picks a random one from the world, and then it generates a whole grid. Um, it doesn't have to be a grid. People do these for like uh, poems or words or stories. It's just a set of tokens that, it get, uh, that get combined together. This means that if you use it for something like Emoji Garden, in order for you to like just remix it and make your own garden, all you have to do is just change what the world looks like. Maybe the pattern if you're really ambitious, but really just the values of the world. So you don't need to know how I painted the emoji to the screen, how I resize things, how do I generate the grid or anything like that. You just need to know what the values of the world are. So this is why people who are programmers were super good at remixing it and making their own gardens. And that was really great. And the thing about this is that Tracery.js is a serious library. It's built by a serious person for serious things. People use it for like video games, story generation, or level generation, for things that, you know, they actually want to do that. But people also use it to generate, you know, ominous eyeballs that the, the end is near, uh, which I think is really important, because it doesn't matter whether or not we get it. If a person has, like, a thing that they want to express, or an artist has, like, an art they want to express, it's fine if you don't get it, but you still want to be able for them to, uh, you still want for them to be able to do it. So in order for this to be possible, then we have to build these tools to help artists build the things. Because if you agreed with me that making things is good, then helping make things, <laughs> helping people make things is also really good and important. And this is where Magenta comes in. Uh, so Magenta is a team that I work on, and it's a team of mostly researchers and some engineers. And the researchers are super smart at making models and making generative models. Um, and we're trying to apply it so that it, like, uh, artists and musicians can use it. So we're trying to explore this like weird role that machine learning can have in the creative process. Not to replace it, but to sort of work with you and help you to make better things. Because for better or for worse, machine learning is kind of like the hot new thing right now. And you hear it everywhere. It can be helpful in super many areas. It can control you know, power, power usage. It can cure cancer and have self-driving cars. But it can also help us make things better. 
And I don't mean automating these things necessarily. So I'll give you like the two minute overview of machine learning just in case you don't know what it is because it's honestly it's far more intimidating uh, than it sounds. It's really a glorified function. We know what functions are. All the algorithms we write are functions. Um, easiest function is double a number. We know how to do this. We, give an, we take an x and we double it, and that's our function. Uh, a more complicated function would be how to like, map directions in Google Maps, how to get from here to there. But that's still a function. It's a function that has two arguments, here to there, and the implementation is like some sort of route doing the algorithm, like Bellman Ford or whatever. But then we have weird functions, like is this a dog or a cat? And the function looks like if I give it an image of a dog, it says dog, and if I give it an image of a cat, it says cat. But I don't actually know how to write this function. I don't really know what a dog looks like in pixels. Like it's not, you know, the distance between the eyes is like 17 pixels and a half or something like that. That's not every dog in every position out there. So this is a really hard function to write. Um, and this is where machine learning comes in. And this is true of like every machine learning algorithm. In machine learning, rather than writing the rules for a function, we let the machine figure out what the rules are and it builds like, this like abstract representation and it builds a function for us. That's all it is, it's not that fancy. So when we build these functions, we start calling them models. So when you hear people refer to like the model does this or the model does that, it's again just a function that knows how to like respond to an input. So this is our function, our model. And if we want to train the model that knows whether something is a cat or a dog, then what we do is start feeding it cats and dogs. Like not for eating, but for looking. So at first the model doesn't know anything. So we show it a picture of a dog and we're like, hey, is this a dog or a cat? And the model goes, is it a cat? And you're like, no, silly, this is a dog. And then we show it a cat, and the model goes, is this a cat? And you're like, yes, it's a cat, congratulations. And then we do this a million times. We feed it a million different examples, and I'm not being like facetious here, it's usually actually a million, a million pieces of data. And once we do this enough times, then the model sort of has like this idea of what all of the cats in the world look like and what of the dogs look, at, look like, and then you're like, is this a dog? And it goes, yes, it's a dog. And the better your model is, the better it is at answering these questions. This is the whole thing about machine learning, that's it. Um, so why is it so good? Because it's actually not new, it's been around forever. I think neural nets were like around in the 60s and 70s, so it's like by no way like the new thing at all. It was so bad that like at some point people start, stopped working on it. The reason why it got so good and it's so hot right now is because everything else around it got good. In particular, compute power got really good, so now we have GPUs and TPUs, so we can do math really fast. Most of the machine learning algorithms are matrix math, and now that we can do it in like a hot second, we can actually run things. Um, I did my master's in like reinforcement learning, which is a different kind of AI, and I would have experiments that would run for like three days, and they would compute like very little matrix math. I think those would run like two hours now. So that got better. Uh, our data sets got better. Most of your machine lear learning algorithms are only as good as the data that you put in, because again, they just like figure out a way to summarize the data that you give them. So if you don't have a lot of data, they're not gonna be able to produce anything good. If you're only feeding it like four pictures of dogs and cats, it's probably gonna flip a coin if something is a dog or a cat. So our data sets got really good. We have things that have like a billion pictures of clothes or a billion pictures of dogs or a billion pictures of, uh, or a billion like pieces of data, like uh, epilepsy data or something like that that people use machine learning for. And then our algorithms got really good because once we could actually run these algorithms really fast, people started like doing novel things. Uh, so they started inventing like new algorithms like GANs that I'm gonna show you a little bit later. And because machine learning got really good, uh, generative models got really good. So the model that I showed you before, the one that goes, is this a cat or a dog? We normally call these classifiers. They classify what a piece of data is. Generative models are a little bit different because they still look at a giant piece of data. So like they could look at all of the cats and the dogs in the universe, but what they do is they generate something that matches that data. So a generative model for cats and dogs would generate a picture of a cat or a picture of a dog. So we have all of these generative models now for images and in particular for audio. So this is an example of something called a music transformer. A transformer is a kind of model that is basically really good at generating audio. So this is a jazz piece, piece that I generated. If the audio works, oh my god. Do we have to do this on every slide? Okay, so the dance is, I unplug everything. I plug the audio back in. I plug, plug the display back in. I press play. I hate my life. Okay, 
do this again. It's a really good piece, too. OK, so give it a second. Do the thing. Honestly. Guys, it won't work. What do you think I'm doing wrong? I will, I'm accepting opinions here. What? No, that was me making sad sounds. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, do it. Hold on. We'll give it a second. Can we visit the URL on that computer? I mean, we can. I can, like, make my speakers go out, but, oh. Oh, I mean, it's going to, yeah, let's try that. It'll sound terrible, but we can do it. Hold on. I like how you're clapping for me, not the music. So this model looked at a whole bunch of music and basically learned one of these fun fancy functions to generate music that sounds like that data set. If I fed it in not jazz, it would like eventually learn how to sound like Queen or like you. If you're a musician, in theory, you could like put your own music in here and it would sound like that. Um, and then it like goes in. We do really creepy things now. So there's this algorithm called again, a generative adversarial network. Um, and it's it's perfect and fantastic and wonderful for generating incredibly accurate uh, pieces of data that look like the input data. So we do these for faces. This site is called This Person Does Not Exist, and all of these are generated humans, and they look like humans, but they do not exist. These are computer machine learning generated humans, and it's creepy as hell, and I don't know why we do it, but the reason why it's so good is because we have this data set. So machine learning, again, only works if you have the huge data set. We have this huge data set, so this is how we learn how to make this algorithm. Uh, it works for cats as well. Uh, it works for many things, because again, we have all of these data sets, so basically whatever you put in, it gets out of it. Some of the cats are a little borked, like that ginger one. Sometimes they have weird artifacts, uh, because again, the model doesn't know what a cat is, right? It's just looked at millions and millions of cats and sort of figured out that these are like, cats are on things, they sleep in the light, they use look like this. So it's gonna put together some of these features that it's learned. Uh, somebody also built this Airbnb does not exist. <laughs> These sites are actually really tragically dead now because it's really expensive to keep this algorithm up, I think. Uh, so these are from Product Hunt. But there's this data set of interior design rooms. I don't know why. Again, we have them, we use them. And it just generates random rooms. These rooms do not exist. These are absolutely computer generated. And they're like fairly high fidelity and like pretty good resolution. Um, and yeah, we can do this. Which is great, I mean, for a video game, I'm sure you can use it, it sounds really useful. So, it's great, we have these algorithms, we're really good at like generating music for elevators or like generating people that aren't people, fantastic. But how do we use this as artists? Because again, the goal of my team is not to like make art or music for people, is to make art and music for, like with people. We wanna help people make better art because uh, machine learning can help them. So. A lot of the things that we do, a lot of the people on my team are musicians, so we focus a lot on music, and we want to make music with people. Um, because in a, in, we live in a world where technology is everywhere. I live in this weird house where everything's automated. Uh, my faucet is automated, so I can tell it to dispense me a cup of water. I'm not joking. Uh, my garbage can is automated. I can wave my hand in front of it, and it opens. Uh, but I still make music like I did five years ago. I play the piano, and I play the ukulele, and I'm still really bad at both of them. I'm really bad at composing. Um, and I want somebody to help me th with this. Like, if somebody can dispose a cup of water without me using my hands, why can't somebody help me make music? So I'm going to show you some demos of things that I built with Magenta.js, and then I'll tell you more about it. Um, 
This is uh, an app called Incredible Spinners. It's built by, the sound is probably gonna die, just gonna warn you. Um, it's built by Taropa on Twitter. Um, and in this app, uh, he uses one of our models to generate these random circles. Uh, and the circles are just like music sequences, melodies. And when you go up and down the melodies, the key changes for the melody. And when you go sideways, it's a different melody. So you can navigate these spinners and you make songs and this is what this instrument looks like, sounds like. Okay, we're gonna do the thing where I think I'm just gonna use my speakers and sit really close to it. All right. But, oh, but now it steals it, this is the problem. It's, hold on, can we do, you guys. All right, we're gonna use speakers, internal speakers, very good. Really loud. Play. Can you hear it? Great. making music, it uses machine learning. He didn't actually like compose these quadrants. But you can use the quadrants to like make songs. And this is a fun new instrument that didn't used to exist before. Um, we also used one of the magenta models in the, one of the recent Bach doodles, the Google doodle, if you saw it. Um, and this was really exciting for us because the Bach doodle goes to like the entire universe. Um, but basically it lets you compose music like Bach would. Uh, Bach used to have a lot of four voice chorales, and this is what the app did. And you don't have to know that Bach used to do four voice chorales. You kind of know what Bach sounds like. He's like fairly cordy and German. Um, <laughs> that's the joke you laugh at? <laughs> Switzerland. Um, so what we did in the app is that you entered basically a melody. Uh, it could be like twinkle, twinkle, little star, or whatever you compose. And then the model would help you harmonize with it. So, um, it would like build the other three voices in a way that sounded like Bach. And we did this by training it on like 306, the very exact number of Bach chorales. And we didn't tell it what Bach rules are and we just like produced these things. Um, and a lot of the, there were like three people that got really upset on the internet because they were like Bach experts. And they were like, this app produces parallel fifths and parallel octaves and Bach would never use a parallel fifth and a parallel octave, how dare you? And we're like, we didn't tell you what, like, we didn't tell the algorithm what a Bach is. We were like, here's 306 pieces of music. What can you do with it? Um, and they're like, yeah, you should have trained it better. I was like, okay, great. Um, and then it turns out we did some research. It turns out Bach actually did use like 100 parallel fists in his entire life. So it was fine. Uh, so this was really fun. It's still up if you like Google it. Uh, we also a built a companion app to it so that if you're actually like a person who wants to compose music, you have way more freedom. So this is like an editor where you can draw notes and then you can like erase them and compose with the model. So here I have this sample melody that I drew. It's like the legal version of Seven Nation Army, which is not quite right. And then I can give this, this melody to uh, the model and then like the robots are gonna go and it's gonna build this harmonization for it. And this is like the white stripes featuring Bach. Um, and then you can do all sorts of things. You can play a little bit with a model. So models have a temperature, which is sort of like the chaos level. The smaller the temperature, the less chaotic the particles are. Uh, so what you get is something more conservative. Um, and then you can do the opposite, like crank up the temperature and then everything is basically like random notes everywhere. And Bach would like crawl out of his grave to hear it. A 
love working on this team because like I literally spend like a week and a half testing this. So all I do is just like listen to music made by robots. Um, and then on this like interface, uh, you can start erasing these nodes and be like, listen, I gave you model, I gave you something, and you returned most of the good things and garbage. So you can like erase some of the model, uh, some of the nodes the model returned. You can like infill particular sections. So you can actually like use this to compose a box sounding like harmonization with like whatever your input is. So you're the musician here and the machine learning is just there to like help do a bunch of grunt work for you. You could do this if you're like a person who's an expert at voice chorales, but if you're not, these are the kind of instruments that I want people to build and to use. We have this awesome interface called a Piano Genie. And a Piano Genie basically has learned to, uh, rather than using the 88 keys on a piano, just use eight. And it sounds like this. Here we just connected it to like one of the fancy pianos that has keys. And this model is trained on like classical, uh, a classical piano competition, so that's what it sounds like that. But it, again, if you're a musician, it could be trained on your music, and this would be like a weird instrument to play your own music. And these are all like really silly. Uh, demos that I've built you because we're not in like our team is very small It's like five to six people uh, and we're not like product builders. We don't build products but if you we all, we built this like sample which is like a set of uh, Five plugins for Ableton Ableton got Ableton is an application that most musicians use nowadays uh, And that's where they live they live inside of Ableton So we made them these plugins to just show people that you could use machine learning in Ableton um, and these plugins basically let you uh, if you have like a beginning of a, of a melody, it continues that melody for you, or it interpolates between two of your melodies, or uh, Drumify is really cool. It takes one of like the really quantized beats, because most of the samples that you use in, uh, in Ableton are very quantized, so they sound really robotic for drums. Uh, but this model was trained on like actual drummers, so we've learned like all of their micro timings and velocities when drumming. Uh, so, the mo so the Drumify plugin would like take your robotic beats and make them into like a super like swingy sounding beat, uh, sounding drums. And they're really fun. So like, you can actually build these very serious tools for musicians with machine learning, and that's really exciting. You can also do this for art. You, just, you don't just have to do it for music. Um, style transfer is a hot thing uh, that's really popular right now. And style transfer is basically you take the style of an image and you slap it on a different image. It's like the world's fanciest Instagram filter. Um, and a lot of the models used to be that you would train like the Monet model, and all that model would be able to do is make something look like Monet, but uh, recently there's been like a whole bunch of work done, so you can do this with like arbitrary images. So here's a picture of Einstein, and I can load the scream, and then you get like the screaming Einstein, or I can do this for Monet, or I can change the Einstein. You can just do whatever pairs you want. Um, and all of this works, again, in the browser with Magenta.js is not like weird Python code that you have to run and package. Um, you can also do this for drawing. So there's a huge data set called QuickDraw. Um, if you remember like two years ago or so, there was an app that like asked you to draw things until like a robot recognized it. It would be like, draw me a cat, and you would draw a cat. Um, and the point of that is with that to collect all of these like labeled pieces of data because labeled data is usually what we need for training these things. We have to tell something that is a cat. Um, and then we are, we are now able to have like all of these generative models that know how to draw cats because a million people drew cats. Uh, so in this app, that I build, you basically like draw a stroke and it continues it for you. You like draw with a machine learning algorithm. So you can draw cats or you can draw a crab. Uh, you can draw like a truck, this gets wheels but it's out of the screen. Or you can draw a whale. Um, and this isn't art. Like I know this isn't art. I don't, I'm not deluded about this. Uh, but this is again a thing that we didn't have like four years ago. We didn't really have this ability to like draw with a machine learning algorithm. If we had better data, if we looked at like paintings or something like that, you could probably produce realistic paintings of cats. This is just the model that draws quick draw cats. So all of these demos that I showed you are built with Magenta.js, which is the library that I work with, uh, that I work on. There's also a Python library called Magenta, but Magenta.js is really exciting to me because I think the web is great at delivering experiences. The web works everywhere. You write it once, it works on all of our phones. Um, and now that we have, some, uh, we have WebGL, all of these machine learning algorithms can actually run really fast in the browser. We're really good at fast matrix math in a browser. Um, so all of the code that I showed you is basically incredibly straightforward. 
uh, Music VA is a model that generates random melodies. So in that demo that we saw all of those quadrants that were spinning, uh, those quadrants were generated with this. So the, the way the code would look like is that you create the model, and then you ask the model to do something, in this case, give you a sample, and then you create a player, because we try to like wrap all of the web audio sins behind like a wall so you don't have to interact with web audio. And this uses like Tone.js behind the scenes. Um, and then you can give that sequence to the player. And all of this, like under, behind all of these functions, there's like a lot of TensorFlow.js and a lot of matrix math and a lot of like hard machine learning that you can look, look at if you want to. But if you don't, if you're like an artist or a musician and you're just like, I really just want random music, these are literally the four lines of code you need to just generate random melodies, um, which is amazing. Uh, that Bach infill model, that one's called Coconut. Um, and then again, you create the model, and then maybe you take one of these sequences that the previous model generated, and you ask the model to infill it. So you give it like one of the voices, and you tell it which voice it is, and what it does back is it gives you back all of the four voices in that chorale. And then again, you can give that chorale to a player, and that's how you get like the back Bach infilling. It's like one extra line of code. For the Piano Genie, the one that like summarized all of the 88 keys at eight, that's also very similar. You create the model, you tell it, you know, what key, one of the eight buttons that you pressed, how random you want the result to be, and it gives you back a note. And you do this over and over again, and that's how like, the entire experience gets played. The same thing happens for images. We, you create the model for style transfer, you give it two source images, and I literally mean like the ID of the image tag that you want the two images to, to get used, and it returns an image data. This is the image data that you like take and put into a canvas. Um, and if you look at like the source code of that image transfer demo, that's exactly what it is. It's like that and like extra CSS and like a whole bunch of like me styling buttons and resizing things. And if it looks really simple and if it looks like absurdly simple, that's because that was our goal when de designing Magenta.js. Uh, we wanted to make it incredibly straightforward and the API incredibly simple to use because again, the target shouldn't be necessarily engineers who know JavaScript and machine learning. It's artists and musicians musicians, because we really believe that code should never hold back art. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I really enjoy working on Magenta, because there's artists out there who have genius ideas, and there's like machine learning researchers out there who have genius ideas but can't like match colors. And unless we like build these libraries to help people, you require both the, like the artist and the researcher to be the same person, and that's really silly. That's not how it works in like the real world. If you think about Degas, who's a fantastic pastel artist, uh, he didn't bring, he didn't build his own like chalk pastels. He like bought them from Sennelier who spent his entire life building chalk pastels and that's all he did. The guy did the drawing. Yo-Yo Ma plays the cello. He doesn't build his own cellos. He like buys a cello that was built in the 1800s. We shouldn't require people that make art with technology to also make that technology. There's this quote from Marshall McLuhan called, uh, that says that the medium is the message. How do you deliver a message? Uh, how you the medium in which you deliver a message changes that message. And this is absolutely true of art. How you perceive art has a lot to do with how you interact with it. So sure, we have a model that generates random songs, but in and of itself, that's not interesting. It's how you interact with the model that generates songs. What do people do with these songs? How, they, how, how do they like apply their creativity to it? That's where it's really interesting. So I wanna show you some really awesome examples that are my favorite right now of doing art uh, with AI. Um, this is an installation built by Mario Klingerman. It's called Memories of a Passerby. Um, and it uses a, the, a GAN, that generative adversarial interview that I showed you before, the one that's really good at generating fake people. Um, so he can generate over and over again these like fake portraits. Uh, and he trained it on like portraits that look a little bit like art, so he stylized them to look like paintings. And the installation is basically this infinite portrait generator. You come in and every like five or 10 seconds you get a new portrait. The thing about this installation is that this is impossible without technology. There's not a physical artist that can generate like infinity many portraits. They maybe can generate like a thousand if they spend like months on it. So this installation wouldn't have existed five years ago. This is new and it's like a new area of art that we can explore. This is an installation built by uh, Robbie Barrett and Ronan Barrow. Same name, different people. Uh, don't know how they found each other. Uh, so Robbie Barrett is an artist that does a lot of art with machine learning, and Ronan Barrow is a physical artist that does oil paintings. Um, so they got together and they trained one of these GANs on Robbie Barrett, Ronan Barrett's 
uh, oil paintings of skulls. So the interaction is a lot like this. So you walk to this machine and it tells you what it's gonna do. And what this does right now is it's going to generate you a random skull painting painted in the style of Ron and Barrett. Um, and you look at it for something like five seconds and then it disappears. And in particular, it literally disappears forever. This combination of pixels, it's marked in the algorithm in such a way that it can never get generated again. This was your skull and your skull alone and nobody will see the skull ever again. And this is fascinating because in this world where like everything's on Instagram and we post like live videos of everything we do in, in our lives, we have this strange, in, like, this strange art where we share the experience but we can't share the art. Nobody can look at two skulls. We all know that everybody's getting a skull but we can't really share what we got. And again, this wouldn't have been possible before these machine learning algorithms existed because we couldn't have generated infinitely many skulls. That's not feasible. There's this quote from Brian Eno that I really love, that whatever you now find weird, ugly, uncomfortable, and nasty about a new medium will surely become its signature. The distorted guitar sound is the sound of something too loud for the medium supposed to carry it. When electric guitars came around, people were horrified. They were like, this is not what a guitar sounds like. Everything, I'm gonna mute this, um, everything that you love in the world has at one point been like hated by probably a white dude in the world. Uh, things like cubism or impressionism or assembling your own Swedish Ikea chairs uh, or, you know, electric guitars, all of these were weird at some point and a whole bunch of people were like, don't feel great about this. Machine learning and art are just another one of these things. We're like, we're, we're building these things that feel uncomfortable but we, that doesn't mean we shouldn't explore them. We shouldn't like let them be super evil and creepy and like track people and be racist. We should monitor how they do, but that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make art with them because art is really important to us as a society. And in order for this to work, we need to make these serious things. All, like the, art, the, the two projects that I showed you before are only possible because a lot of people spend a lot of time and effort to generate these like infinite many things. Um, and without those algorithms, we couldn't have built those art installations. And I think that building serious things is really great. I think we should use machine learning to like drive cars better and cure cancer and go to space. But we should also use machine learning to like build better art or weirder art. Um, and if this means like spending more time in making algorithms that aren't like necessarily targeted at serious things, but at people, you know, painting a skull for five seconds and never looking at it again, then I think we should absolutely do this. Um, thank you. So some questions? Can you use the microphone in front of you, please? Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Oh, it was very interesting and very inspiring, thank you. Thank I have you. a question about um, if I use one of your Magenta tools, uh, what's the right situation? Who owns the result? Yeah, that's a really great question. And uh, the answer is actually a little bit complicated. So we, all of the models that we publish are open source. And all of the models that we publish are built with open source data. So the data sets are always open source and the model is open source. We have models that we haven't published just because we haven't been, able, like it's built on like copyrighted music, for example. So with the models that we published, you own the rights to it, but that's not to say that like one lawyer out there one day will be like, this sounds too much like Bohemian Rhapsody and you like owe money to Queen. At the moment, there's like no law really about this. There is not, uh, in, if you look at like all of the copyright, there was recently an article about this, I think in The Verge, um, but like if you look at all the copyright law, it doesn't say who produces it, like the word human or the word machine isn't in there. So people don't really know. When The way we built them is that you own the rights to it, but I'm not a lawyer and I can't guarantee this will always be true. But like, yeah, we only publish open source things. Yeah. Um, uh, two questions, actually. You talked about uh, with, with the music, with the music uh, models, you talked about micro timings, and I was, I was just wanting to know what, um, what, whether your, how your sources are coded. Are they MIDI? How you're supposed to sorry? How your sources are encoded? It's MIDI rather than actual it audio. It's it's always MIDI, yeah. Okay. So but recorded from real people. Yeah, on okay. like an elec electric drum set. Yeah. Okay. And the other question is about the choral harmonization, which kind of blew me away. Uh, are you planning to try it on counterpoint anytime soon? 
Um, I don't know if that's a thing we're looking at. So one of the biggest problems with like, are we going to try this on this, is that we don't have necessarily labeled data. Um, so I think for counterpoint, we would have to like start looking at pieces that are explicitly marked at counterpoint and find the counterpoint sections. So, because otherwise like if you just give it a huge Bach piece, it's not gonna learn like the thing that is a counterpoint. Um, it's just gonna like, learn like sometimes Bach has counterpoints. I don't know what a counterpoint is. Um, so I don't think we're particularly looking at this right now. That doesn't, you should. Uh, how do you integrate uh, Magento with Ableton? With Ableton? So um, Ableton has a thing now where Max for Live, the latest version, like eight or whatever it is, uh, it lets you write Node. It has like a little Node script object, so you can write like Node code, and it works through Max for Live in Ableton. So that's how. Um, if you go to the Magenta Studio, g.co slash magenta slash studio, uh, there's like a blog post about how we built it. And, and the code is open source, too. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, so I actually have one question. Uh, yeah. For the back thing, did you use... Uh, God, I thought it was going to be about Polymer. No, 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 you're, you're safe. <laughs> so um, for the back thing, did you actually use actual music or just MIDI's? MIDI, 306 MIDI files. So we have music, uh, we have models that actually work with actual music. The problem is... With actual music, you're playing with waveforms, so the model is a little bit different. We have models that know how to produce something that sounds like a piano or like an actual MP3 of a piano composition, but that's a very different model than a model that looks like a MIDI file that's a very lovely and perfect data structure for representing music. Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, one last round of applause for Monica. Thank this you. Is for you.